Yes, I think that there is a, I heard about a, a German zero minutes rule. I think it applied to some symphony or something. So, so there it's absolutely on the clock. After that, perfect. That's, that's very German. Well, today it will be a very visual thing, so I... Dancing matrices. And hopefully the whole quiver representation theory in 15 minutes. We have to figure out a way to put uh, the program on the website because it won't be so easy to take notes, so the program should help. Uh, also, try to get uh, Mathematica if you can. I think it's free on campus, right? Okay, so we should start. Almost, I mean, it's not quite seven, but let's let's give it a try. So we're going to run this program, and uh, this should uh, make the connection between a graph a n. Do you see here graph a n? Yes. And uh, one of the a d e graphs. Here it's a graph d four, starting at an arbitrary vertex. Yes. So. Uh, uh, let us uh, write the theorem for any AD graph G. And any vertex V of G, there is a unique uh, Q uh, map. We'll have to fix the terminology A to G. with where A is the AN graph with the same norm of delta A, or same, uh, same Coxeter number. And, uh, and the vertex one of A maps to V. So you have uh, the picture goes like this. It's, this is some A and graph. This is your, uh, you know, an E6 or E7, something. And, uh, and now you can map the vertex one into, or oh, this, this uh, A and must be considerably bigger. Yes, so this is E7, so this should have uh, 17 vertices. So. 
And so that this thing maps into V. Yes, so it can be completed in a unique way up to gauge. And unique, let's put here up to gauge. And remember that the gauge was here, for instance, U1. And if you have a K edges, then it's here U. So if there are K edges, then it's UK, the unitary group K. So you should think of those as some linear maps, the edges. You should always think of them concretely, yes? They are linear maps, and you can choose a basis, and the edges, uh, the edges uh, label the basis, so you have a freedom of choice of uh, UK. Yes, you can choose those connectors as you wish. So now, well, uh, this is uh, it's Monday, yes, yeah, so it's not, uh, we should, uh, well, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens in a minute. Let me uh, uh, put here some of the corners, you see. The idea is that if you fix two corners like this, there should be a unitary. Uh, what's the dimension of this unitary with these two corners? One by one. Do you see there's one path here and there's one path on the top, right? Yeah? And the second one, uh, you see it's similarly one by one, yes, kind of by symmetry. And here we'll, we'll stop, we'll fix this. See here, you can see a little bit better. Uh, here there's the next one, yes, from A2. I mean the second one of uh, the second vertex of AN. Can you see? So it's this with the top, right? And there are three paths on the top. Yes? And three paths through the bottom, which were constructed already. Right? Can you see that? So the, the red ones were built already, and now, uh, now you're building the, the blue ones. Yes? So that tells you exactly how big this one is, right? You need two because altogether you need three blue things, three blue edges here, yeah? while red ones you had three, right? So, so what we're going to do now is uh, unfold this. You see there's a parameter called unfolding. Open it up like this. Uh, can you see what's going on? So we took now the graph D4. Can you see the graph D4, right? It's a letter Y, but it's uh, starting with a vertex. So we put the graph D4, yes, and we took the Cartesian product D4 times, so we have here G, Cartesian product over Z mod 2, with, uh, or rather, let's put it like this. This is your AN graph, Cartesian product over Z mod 2 with G. Uh, do you happen to remember why should these two graphs have the same, uh, have the same norm? What could be a reason? What do you map with this map? You map paths, yes? And if you remember, the uh, norm of the graph was count, you remember from the example with rabbits, yes? The D4, uh, the A4, yes? Which was uh, the Fibonacci numbers. That uh, the, uh, the, the Coxet, this uh, norm of the Laplacian, yes? It's a highest eigenvalue. There's a Peron Frobenius theory. So that tells you that if you apply, if you take powers of the matrix, then, and you apply them to a positive vector, then uh, they're going to multiply that vector roughly by, asymptotically by, uh, by exactly the norm of the matrix, yes, which is the highest eigenvalue. Yeah? So that's why you, you need, the two graphs need to, uh, need to have the same norm because they're going to, uh, we're going to map paths with this. That will be statistical mechanics. 
So let's uh, let's unfold it. Do you see now the the uh, the upper vertex has become several, yes? And uh, look what happens here at the end. So you see, once again, do you see that the, uh, the fact that you have a unitary, right? This looks strange, so maybe uh, you should tell me when, when you want to see it more. Uh, so... Do you see that the sum of the two of the two red number of the two blue numbers must be equal to the sum of the other of the others? Yes, yeah. The sum of the red numbers here, yes, is equal must be equal to the sum of the blue numbers. Let's look again at how they came up. Do you see this is a unitary, right? There's a unitary going for the two fixed corners. So you fix these two corners. And there is a unitary between the paths on the AN graph and uh, the auxiliary graph versus going first on the auxiliary and then up. Yes? This is a statistical mechanical model with plaquette, with plaquettes, yes? And this is what I call the biunitary connection. So now uh, the the property here, of course, a unitary must be square, yes? Because it's a change of basis. So so the unitary must be square. And look what, what happens here. You have three red lines, right? And three blue lines. So once you put it like this, you find that for this missing point, the sum, so you have these dimensions, some numbers, and you have the, the Laplacian, this is sum of neighbors, sum of neighbors the Laplacian of A applied to the vector dimension is equal to the Laplacian of G applied to the vector dimension. So the dimension are those numbers, yes? So this is, this is vertical and this is horizontal. So it tells you that if you take the sum of neighbors of the point where the cursor is, you see, there are neighbors above and below, right? And the sum is three. And there are neighbors on the graph uh, D, yes? Right? So this is what uh, I call the biharmonic vector. Harmonic means that the Laplacian is zero, right? So this means that delta A, delta vertical, delta A is equal to, so let's put it here, delta vertical minus delta horizontal is equal to zero, applied to the vector. So the idea will be the following, by the way of linear algebra. You have a space, this particular one, for instance, uh, this, this is a, uh, the y, what you see here in white are the, some roots, we're going to discuss them, but are some vectors on a sphere, yes? There are a lot of them. Uh, here there are vectors on a sphere in four dimensions projected down. So there are 24 of them. They're exactly the uh, roots of type D4 that we're studying. So the idea is what kind of basis should you take in, in a vector which has a lot of, uh, in a vector space which has a lot of symmetry. And uh, what we're going to do is take as basis everything. So it's not going to be a basis. The, uh, the numbers are going be to be overdetermined, but we don't break the symmetry. And this overdetermination is exactly this. Now, let's start to fill it. 
do you have any uh, any questions? So, um, look, the idea is that this should, these should be unitaries. So you see, they're moving, and uh, the first thing, each of them should be a unitary. Remember, this were, these were the first three, which were one by one. Do you remember? Yes? And this is a gauge, the freedom of gauge that we had. Remember, these were wires, yes? So this was a freedom of gauge, yes? So you have a freedom, actually here we have even a freedom of gauge uh, for them vertically. So it means that each of them can be multiplied from the side of this thick line by U1, yes? And the norm of the unitary should be one, the product of these two numbers. This is what we had. So once again, these are unitaries one by one and scaled by how much? One, yes? And we can fill them. This part clear, we have a gauge, we have a freedom to multiply each of them with a number of modulus one, yes? The scaling is exactly square root of the product of the corresponding two numbers, the eigenvector from here and the eigenvector from here. Yeah? Now let's go to the next. Yes, so they assemble this way. Okay. Do you see, this is exactly the one that we were looking at. It was a three by three unitary, yes? Right? With the red, remember, it came from before. Right? The red was done in the step number one when we had corners, something like this, yes? Then we had the bottom, the red, yes? So now we are here and Look what the problem is. We have already filled the unitary, the first row, in the previous step. The, it's a scaled unitary, and the scaling, this means a unitary multiplied by a constant, yes? And the scaling is exactly square root of the product of these two numbers, which is altogether three to the one half, right? And indeed, the sum of the squares of these numbers is three to the one half, right? I mean, square root of this, yes. Right. Yes. Exactly, and this biunitarity condition, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. This biunitarity condition I was telling you is extremely hard to come by. I mean, it's as hard as finding, say, finite groups. You know, you, you don't just find finite groups of a certain order, of order eight, just by tossing a coin, right? So it's, uh, uh, yes, so these are unitaries which satisfy this condition that, the, the, that if I fix these two vertices, it's unitary, and if I fix the other, the vertices the other way, it's also unitary. Yes? And the scaling is, is uh, exactly the product, square root of the product of these two numbers. Yes, yes, that's exactly what we're doing. But uh, they are dancing, uh, kind of, uh, I, I had promised before you came that we'll show dancing unitaries, uh, dancing uh, linear algebra. You see, there's, there's a problem. I mean, uh, linear algebra has a certain image problem. Now, I see everybody is very serious, and this is Monday. Uh, the, linear algebra has a very serious problem. I mean, although it's fundamental, it's not as popular as it should be. For instance, if you compare it with uh, Samba, yes, you see uh, the movement in the first one, very intense, very varied formations, uh, very dynamic, everything. While the linear algebra, this is an image from the web, is very static, yes? However, of course, the linear algebra is fundamental because quantum mechanics is linear, yes? 
So uh, we're going to remedy this by doing this by unitary linear algebra. The movement is very intense. Uh, formations are very varied. Formations are very dynamic. So now, uh, now, uh, in fact, actually, if you look, uh, if you look here, you could uh, you could use this for uh, samba formations. You know that's what uh, those fellows do. Yes, as they move from one formation to the other. Yes, so, uh, but I should answer your question a bit more seriously. The point is here that we have something which is happening along these lines, and the structure is in the image. This is, uh, the image suggests what we should do. So let's, let's go, and actually the proof of that theorem will be very visual. So once again, we fill the first row, right? The unitary. And we had gauge, remember, the physics part. Yes, we have freedom of choice for the yellow lines. Yes, which means exactly that we could multiply these unitaries. Now, on your uh, pad, on your notepad, you should make these, uh, these thick lines Do you see on the two sides. They indicate exactly how to assemble them. You don't need to move them on your pad, but once you write them like this, it should be fairly clear what to do with them. So now we move them like this. Do you see, what do you see here? We have the first row completed, yes? And we have to complete two more rows to make this a unitary, which is normed, which is multiplied by square root of these two numbers of the product, which is three to the one half, yes? So let's do that. I just filled it at random. These are fractions, and uh, yes. So, if you have a three-dimensional space, yes, you have already one vector in it, and you need to complete the other two. What? Hmm? Yeah, in this case, you can take them real for a n into something. Yes, but but uh, we'll. Uh, just in case you may use complex ones, we'll, uh, we'll deal with that. There, there is another uh, general theorem where you use complex things and they're connected to knots, braids and knots. So here, once again, here's a problem. You have to fill, uh, do you see, you have one vector already. And do you see, amazingly, it comes up correctly normalized. Do you see, it has the right length. Although we built it out of pieces, one, 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 yes, it has a correct length, which is square root of the product of these two, yes? So the length is root three. Clear? So we need to complete it with two more vectors of length root three. What's a gauge for that? You have a vector and you need to pick two more vectors. This is a linear algebra requirement. You have a vector in a 3D space, and you need to pick two more vectors to make it an orthonormal basis. Yeah? Exactly. You have one. So what's the freedom for the other two? U2. Yes? Exactly. So in this case, it's U2. And how much gauge do you have? How much freedom of choice do you have here? Oops, look at it. There's a blue thing there. It's U2, do you see? Because you have these two new lines in the middle, yes? So you have to choose two more vectors, and you have a gauge U2. So you can, this means that the choice is up to gauge. It's unique up to gauge because you need to choose two more vectors and the freedom of choice, the gauge, is U2, right? This was a linear algebra requirement for the course. You see the very small unitaries. So is it clear? Look, we have a two. Remember, this was a line of two, yes? We could choose a basis and these two actually act here sideways. Yes? 
So if we choose other two vectors, they're exactly the same up to gauge. Yes? So now we move them on the other side again. So we, they are chosen. I just chose them at, uh, uh, more or less at random. And now we move them on the other side, look like this. And they make unitaries this way. So you see now, we have a vector which amazingly comes with exactly the right length. Do you see? This is the length is square root of these, which is square root of 2, yes? Do you squeeze square root of 1 times 2? And the length of this vector, if you, do, if you square it, is going to be 2 over 4 plus 6 over 4, which is 2, yes? Nope, this is absolutely built into the model. That's what the theorem states, that the, uh, that the choice is unique. And the choice unique means that, every, that you complete them exactly like this, and that every step you have exactly the freedom that you need to, to choose it uniquely. The length of the columns after you rearrange them is going to be... Uh, the length of the, of the vectors on the horizontal is going to be just right. Yes, so it looks, uh, I mean, it's a very, remember that uh, nothing about these graphs ADE is, is, uh, is random at all. And uh, as we'll see in this, uh, in this simple statement, in this simple construction, we'll do the whole uh, algebraic theory of quivers, which is applied in many places and uh, Arthur assured me that quite a number of people in the physics department are using it as well. We're going to do this in a very short, uh, short time. So now you see we fill uh, the next thing, the next, uh, I mean these unitaries, with something, some vectors which are orthogonal on the first ones, right? And they have the correct norms, so again I chose them absolutely at random, but the choice is unique up to gauge, yes? Okay, and now we move them the other way. So the hint again is that, do you see the black, the thick edges? Yes? If you see the thick edges, they are exactly suggesting to you how to glue the, how to glue the things, yes? When you move them around. Yeah? Oh, the moving, thank you. No, that's a very good, uh, it's a very good question. The moving corresponds to the following uh, here. You see the, the, these, the, there are numbers in these squares. Truthy, yes, so they are here, for instance, uh, just here about two of them, yes? So we can uh, move them to here. Do you see, so between this, it's a one by one unit which uses the same numbers. So the same numbers, yes, the same numbers appear in, in two unitaries. Exactly. So when we have, a, when, if we have a, um, you see, we, we may use here an entry of a unitary and then we may choose these two. You see, and then the same thing is used in a different unitary, yes? So the visual idea here is that since everything is used twice, uh, we better rearrange them, yes? Because the process of rearrangement itself may give us, uh, may give us a, uh, a feeling about, uh, about what's going on, yes? Yeah. Exactly. Yes, yes. Absolutely. So it's an orthonormal basis, but miraculously, once you reassemble them, what you get uh, on the level N are some half-filled unitaries, yes, 
which in which the vectors are orthogonal on each other, although they're coming from very different matrices, they are orthogonal on each other, yes, and, uh, and they have exactly the correct length. Yes, and of course, if you, if you cut a vector into pieces, into, then uh, the length of the vector is the sum of the length of the respective pieces square, right? The length square is the sum of the length square of each piece which, by the way, is an important statement in quantum mechanics or information where you do such things. Yes? Right, so this should correspond, uh, this, should, this should have a, a nice meaning also related to quantum information because you are, uh, remember, projecting onto, onto a subspace is what the measurement is all about. So, let's put it back here. Yes, and you see here we are almost finished, except for this. Do you see the, the, the vectors have length uh, root, o, root 3? Yes, it's square root of the product of these. And they do have this length, although they come from, do you see they came from vertical things. But they have exactly the correct length. And this leaves room for one more vector which is also going to belong to them. Yes? So we'll do that. And this is the one that fits. And it's unique up to what gauge? The gauge is in blue. Up to, well, it didn't pop up here. So the gauge, up to what gauge? Well, we filled one more, the last row. It's up to U1, yes? So it's exactly up to the path that goes, that goes through the bottom. Do you see this path here? Up to this path. So you see that here the paths were replaced by numbers on the graph. Yes, these numbers are, are uh, by harmonic. And, uh, and these are the matrices. Uh, so the, the nice thing about this is that it works in a context way bigger than, than uh, quiver theory or anything like this. So this is a break, uh, the breakthrough towards the higher math. Yes, so on any of those higher math graphs that I was showing you, this works exactly the same way, with some adaptations, but, uh, but exactly the same proof. So uh, the proof, well, here, the proof is, that, uh, is the one that I mentioned, but we, we'll write it. But before that, let me, let me ask, yes, if you have any questions, please ask. This is, is very important for me. Ah, yes, absolutely. I was just, thank you, thank you. So I just adjusted them this morning and uh, because I, I had a hard time uh, formatting the things, so uh, so I must have uh, I must have uh, done it. It's somewhere here, but uh, it it won't be. This is a program that uh, that generates, I think. Yes, so it's uh, it's uh, one of these uh, texts. Uh, so uh, yes, so it's just two to the one half. We'll adjust it. Thank you, that, that's very good. Now, here's a question. So let's put them back in the middle, yes? Now the idea and the definition is that every path from the top will be given a number. So there is a number on every path. And the question for you is to figure out how to compute a number out of this data for every path. Read the dimensions of the matrices, of those matrix fragments. For instance, as we go, look, we take the path from the top up to here, yes? This path. So this matrix is one by one, yes? This matrix, if you, if you twist your, I mean, if you, if you lean your head in a suitable way, this should be one by two. This one is 
two by one. So how do you get a number out of this? Well, no, almost. You have a matrix one by three, then a matrix three by five, then a matrix five by two. You multiply them, yes? So this is, uh, the nice part is that you take a path now and you multiply these matrices. Yes, their dimensions just fit, yeah? So that way, this would give you a map from any path and we're going to take, uh, uh, take here the first paths. This, this is from the top, this one and this one. Yes, these are paths. So let's see what's the product on the first one. It's uh, one times, uh, times uh, that matrix and we want to make it uh, one by two. So the result here would be six to the one half. And uh, so remember, yes, these two last numbers are, are a bit wrong. Maybe I can... Uh, I can fix them. Uh, this should be instead of uh, just a bit. Thank you. This, uh, but it's, it's, it's very good that you that you saw that. So uh, uh, there are some text. Aha! This is a text, and this is the. Uh, uh, let's put here one. I think so. This is where one of them is zero. Yes. And this, the other one is one. And uh, so this is a zero on the one. And this one, the next one should be also, there's a two, two, and this should be a two, one. And I think that that should kind of do it. And now we fill it up to the end. And, uh, ah, and we got the, the thing slightly off, no problem. So, uh, but you you see the you see the uh, yes. Yeah, so this is two one. This one was two here, but we need another one which uh, which has a zero near it, and uh, uh, it's probably it should be. Two, two, zero, and this is zero, and then it's this one, and this one is, uh, uh, ah, there we got it. This one is zero and two, one, so this one should be zero and two, one. Yes, so that should be it. Uh, we fill it, and we unfold it, and this is it, yes. So these are the correct numbers. Yeah? Do you see the... Now, so the idea is that you take these matrices along a path and you multiply them. Yes, so let's see here, this is 6 to the 1 half over 2. And this is uh, 2 to the 1 half over 2. And this next one is, you see here we, we multiply them just uh, one by one, so there's nothing really to multiply. This one is negative six to the one half over two, and two to the one half over two. And this one is, is uh, the last one is zero, and uh, negative two to the one half over one. So, it means that we have how many paths up to there? From the top, do you remember? It was, there's a number there. We have two of these essential paths, two of these paths, you see, and, uh, and the first one is something like six to the one half over two times plus one, negative one, and zero. This is the top part. 
And the other one is 2 to the 1 half over 2. plus 1, plus 1, and minus 2, negative 2. So these are the coefficients of the path as we multiply the path along, yes? If the matrix ends up with a 2, you see the, the last dimension is 2. So there are two of these special paths. These matrices end up being two-dimensional once we multiply them along a path, yes? And we read them as, we're going to call these essential paths from the first vector up to some other point, yes? P. And the essential paths are a linear combination of paths. linear combination of paths. Up to a scaling, which is not important, this linear combination is the following, plus one, minus one, zero. Yes, and the other one is plus one, plus one, and negative two. Yes? So, once again, is this clear what we're doing? We're multiplying the matrices along each path. We get numbers, yes? Yes, this one, you see, we got a, a matrix. We have multiplied here the one by one matrix one, yes? It's this, I think, times one, so it's, it's on this side. Yes. Yes, and uh, that's what we got, six to the one half and this. Yes, they're from the very top, from the very top up to, a set, up to every point. So you're going to get, get the paths with some coefficient. Yes? Ah, exactly. We get nine of them, but quite a number of them would be zero. For instance, the, uh, and how many essential paths, how many of these essential paths should we get? It's a one. Do you see there's a last one? There's a one at the bottom, yes? And we shall, we shall do this just in an instance. Yes? Are uh, here's what we do. This, is, this should be something very familiar to physicists. What we do is we take this path, yes? This is from the vertex one, this is in A, A, A n, yes? In the graph A, the vertical graph. And we put here horizontal things, these yellow ones. And we go here from the top vertex V, yes, to each, each path, yes? Moreover, how many do we have here to the middle point? How many yellow edges? We had two yellow edges, so we had two yellow edges. Yes, so we do this for every choice of an edge. And remember, the, the basic computation in statistical mechanics in the model with plaquettes is that you have the boundary given, yes? You fill it in all possible ways, and then you take the product of the numbers in the cells. Yes? You have a boundary, you fill it with cells, and then you take, and you sum those products, yes? So it's a big sum. It's the exact correspondence as I was showing last time because it's a sum of products over an area 
if you could take the logarithm, this would be exactly the integral of e to some integral. And that, uh, that thing at the top is exactly the uh, Lagrangian. Yes, so that is the action. So it's, it's a sum, so it's exactly the, the sum that's aimed at in the quantum field theory, but a discrete version of this. Right, so we're mapping the paths of An, of which there's just one, starting from the vertex up to a point. We're mapping it in all possible ways on this graph. And, but what is the, the last thing, the relation on the, like, the Yeah, uh, uh, right, more or less, yes, something like this. I mean, you see, we, we have here some, uh, think of the yellow things as endpoints, yes? They are exactly this, the endpoint, yes? The top is this given edge. We started with the idea that there's only one edge from 1 to V, that's in the statement of the theorem, yes? And we take just one strip here, Yes, and we, uh, we make this computation. By the way, what, do, what should we do next or at some point? Uh, how the, does this differ from the more general statistical mechanical computation? It's just one strip, right? So we could put several of these one after the other, yes? We can compose such maps. So we'll have then more here. But this is the idea once again. This, this path is unique. It's from a point 1 to a point k, yes? Point 1 to a point k on the graph A. Yes, here we use these cells. So for every, for each yellow edge at the bottom, we compute a number. Yes, this number is exactly the number computed by statistical mechanics, the model in plaquettes. Yes, we have uh, the verticals, so we have the boundary, and in which, in this case, uh, over what do we sum? In this particular case, we sum over this one. Yes, you always sum over every internal part. That's. Uh, that's, the, that's a basic computation in statistical mechanics. The so computation, again, in a model with plaquette. It, so it's the sum of two terms, right? One corresponds to one of those. It's not a sum. This one is part of the boundary. So it's an array of two things. So you have one for every choice here. But it's a sum over these. So the statistical mechanics uh, computation is the following, which is, this is the one that, that we gave, uh, that I was mentioning last time, yes? It's, so given, given the frame, yes? So these paths are given on the outside. You take the sum over all the inner over all the inner labels, any choice, yes, of the product over all cells of that number in the cell of W of the cell, which is in the comp complex numbers. Exactly, the gauge invariance in the middle of such things will cancel because you have a cell and the other one is flipped, yes? So here you conjugate I mean, I, I have no idea what, uh, what we do here in statistics, but you conjugate in chessboard. Uh, 
So you conjugate, you take the complex conjugate in chessboard. So by conjugating, you're conjugating the numbers that you get. You're conjugating the numbers that you get. Exactly. And so, so do you have to do here when you take the multiplication of those matrices. And let me just uh, tell you, let's, let's look at again here, once again. Hey, the problem, uh, as I see it, uh, is that uh, the linear algebra, I mean, I couldn't put as a requirement to have uh, moving linear algebra or something like this. So, so since the usual one is static, uh, but this is, uh, so it's a, it's a very powerful model. I mean, it, it, uh, it just gives you the whole, uh, so first it generalizes to each and any kind of math, and second is that it gives you the whole uh, quiver theory, as we'll see next time. Obviously, there's no more time now, but I will uh, tell you even, uh, uh, I will I will indicate to you briefly the the uh, the proof. Now, uh, can you see something special about these uh, about these numbers? Fast. See, the point is that you you should have the eyes always open for symmetry. I like that. Whenever I broke at some point the symmetry, people uh, people noticed it in this room. So you should have an eye for symmetry, yes, and you should have an eye for things that happen. So what exactly happens here with these numbers? Yes? Even simpler. So what happens here with these, these uh, three numbers here and these three numbers here? They sum, they add to zero, yes? Now we're going to do this, you see, uh, as in quantum field theory, we're going to have this operator look like this. Now you've seen all kinds of caps and cups. Yes, in quantum field theory, all kinds of pictures. So what do you think that thing would do? Well, it does exactly what it shows that it does. So maybe somebody who didn't answer yet. What would that operator do? Do you see that thick line? Yes? What exactly should it do to those edges? Yeah, we have a thick line like this, yes? Think of it as acting this way. So you should lean your head. It acts this way, yes? So this is the input. What's the output here? Well, the output is Nothing, yes. Now we're doing quantum field theory. What is nothing? It's a vacuum, and the vacuum is a corresponds to the vacuum corresponds to a number, yes. So we should get a number. And what exactly does this do to two edges? Do you see these are two edges? Yes. It takes the edges and well, it takes these two edges and. Yes, it connects them together, do you see? I didn't have the time to program the whole uh, dancing edges, but you can imagine that the edges just come along, they meet, they do what? Which is very quantum field theoretical. Once they meet, they annihilate, yes. And what remains is just a number, which is some kind of energy and so. And what happens here with these? This one would annihilate to zero, do you see? The zero is a coefficient of the whole picture, yes? So these two edges would annihilate, yes? The edges would annihilate to one, but there's a coefficient zero, yes? These two edges would also annihilate. Those two edges would also annihilate. So what's the result? The total result is zero, yes? which is, let's write it, 1 minus 1 plus 0, yes? So if you annihilate all those, the edges. So this way, with thick lines, you can transport the edges somewhere else, you can annihilate them, and so on. So this would be exactly the, the kind of theory you do for, for SU2. In fact, here, without you noticing, these unitaries give you the whole theory of quantum SU2 as well. 
So uh, representations and all that at the root of unity. Yes, so once again, is this part clear? If you annihilate this edge, yes? For instance, what would happen if you annihilate this edge where there are two different edges? If you annihilate this, these two, since they're different, if you annihilate something with its... With, so in this case, the annihilation would be directly zero. Yes, so the annihilation of an edge with its inverse, so if you make a step forward and then a step backward, the annihilation of these two is one. That's a convention. And if you take a step this and then this, the annihilation of the two would be zero because they don't match. Yes, so the annihilation is in mathematics a chronic symbol of the two edges after you do exactly what that letter U shows you, the cap and cup. Yes? So the conclusion is what? That on this path, if you annihilate two consecutive floors, you get, on this essential path, we'll have the definition next time, you get, but look, no, this total thing would be zero, yes? And here, zero. So these are the paths for which when you annihilate two consecutive floors, linear combination of paths, if you annihilate two consecutive floors, you get zero, yes? And from what property of the unitary should this come? And then we can, can go. That the columns are orthogonal to each other, yes? The rows and columns are orthogonal to each other, yes? So the fact that those are unitary, contains this thing. And in representation theory, it's a theory of Hermann Weyl, which tells you that there is a highest weight representation in any tensor product, and that that highest weight representation is obtained by throwing away all the lower weight ones, which may appear. And the lower weight ones are exactly obtained by this kind of annihilation. So. So uh, the foundations of uh, representation theory will be just in this, in, in working with these, uh, these matrices, yes? So we shouldn't go too fast because uh, it's probably, I mean, they're, they're kind of new for me. I never computed these unitaries up until a few days ago. So this is just, uh, uh, but uh, I knew I had worked with essential path for, for decades, I introduced the essential path about 20 years ago in math, and, uh, uh, but, uh, and it was clear that something repetitive was going on, and this repetitive thing is just the fact that they come out of these unitaries. So uh, again, what we did today was take unitaries, shatter them into pieces, rearrange the pieces into other unitaries, and then take the pieces along paths the dimensions match, we take the product, yes? And the product is exactly the... the uh, and the last question before you go, yes? This product, the mysterious product, is what on the blackboard? The product along a path, because it is at my back. Don't look at me, look at the blackboard. So what on the blackboard is that product along a path? Oh, it's right behind me. Can you see a product along a path? It's which of the pictures? A product along a path from 1 to K. Can you see it? It's on the blackboard. Look, it's this one. Do you see? It's exactly a statistical mechanical sum for just one column, yes? The way that's done, look, this is a statistical mechanical sum, is you sum over the intermediate things, yes? What are the intermediate things here? They're indices. And that is exactly what the product of matrices is, yes? You sum over 
the indices in the middle taking all the values. So probable matrix is a statistical mechanical sum, yes? That's exactly that one. So if you have a column, that's a product of matrices. And these matrices are exactly the squares there, yes? And these are all fragments of unitaries. The next time we'll do all of uh, the represent, I mean, we'll start to do all of representation theory of, of uh, groups and so, just based on this. Okay, so we should stop here. Uh, there is, if you want to continue the discussion, there's a, uh, there's a media day, I think. Uh, I thought that only football players, at least at uh, the university where I come from, uh, those fellows are not allowed to talk to the media because who knows what they're going to say. So there is a specialized media day in which, under strict supervision, they're supposed to answer questions. So, so this is happening now in the box center with math. <laughs>